hey, I talked to my builders, they're giving us ideas, and I talked to my sales reps, in some cases sales managers, we've got an idea. I know. I'm going to challenge you to say is you need to move beyond anecdotal conversations. And by the way, as a builder, builders lie. If they just scrap 25 acres and are not going to build another 150 homes, they might not be thrilled to tell you that. So heads up, builders lie. Put that coffee down. I'm not here to waste your time. Okay. I certainly hope you're not here to waste mine. So I'm going to keep this short. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. The most valuable commodity I know of is information. Wouldn't you agree? Coffee's for closers only. Well, hello there, friends. Welcome back to the Behind Your Back podcast with me, Bradley Hartman. On the show and in today's episode, we're going to give you some ideas to rethink sales performance to help you sell more faster, at higher margins, and have more fun doing it. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Capital One Trade Credit. If you, my friend, are interested in growing top-line revenues while increasing cash flow, while decreasing risk, that's right, all those three things at the same time, they are not mutually exclusive, and by leveraging a state-of-the-art digital platform to make it easier for your customers to buy from you, if all this sounds very enticing, well, it might be. You should check it out. Go to Capital One Trade Credit and see if it's a fit for you. Now, in today's episode, we are going to introduce an idea, a framework for an idea, as well as a tool to help you better understand the lead measures, the things that if you do well and you do them consistently from a sales perspective, good things will happen. More revenue, more profits, more loyalty, all those things will happen on their own. So instead of looking at the result, hey, what was the sales and gross margin and gross profit dollars, right? Those are the three things we generally look at. We're gonna back up and say, let's set those off to the side. What are the things that we need to do up front that if we do them well and we do them consistently and we do them predictably, the revenue and the margins and the gross profit dollars, those are just going to happen on their own as a result of what we've already done. And if we can do that, then our lives get much easier from an ownership standpoint, from a sales management standpoint, and the sales rep standpoint. And this idea, this framework, and this tool that we're going to provide to you to see if it's a fit for you is called the sales performance box score. So let's break that down into its two parts. Sales performance, fairly obvious. We're not going to uh, digress into that. The box score. Uh Uh-huh. Box score. I know, crazy. We found a way to bring in a sporting reference into the sales world, something that we've never done before. Yeah, the box score for baseball is a condensed accounting of what we believe is important. When the question is, all right, if I'm watching a baseball game, you know, what should we measure? What should we count? What is important? Now, those are three distinct questions, but we'll ignore that for now. Well, what do we do if we're watching a game? How do we know how the different players contributed to the overall outcome, well, that is the box score. And to develop a high-performance sales culture, these are not insignificant questions to ask. What should we measure? How should we count them? And why are they important, right? And as an outsider to our clients, when we come in to help them elevate their sales performance, make them more predictable, make them more repeatable, and help prepare them for inevitably On a long enough timeline, maybe it's months, maybe we're already there, maybe it's years. On a long enough timeline, maybe we're here now, maybe it's a few months, maybe it's several months, we will be going into a recession. How do we make sure we are preparing our team to be resilient and begin prospecting with confidence and intentionality when we need to do so? So for that reason, I'm always looking at the lead measures. And if I come in and I hear... Salesman A, great guy, sold $3 million at 30% margin, crushing it. I say, okay, that's cool. All right, we can look at that. Good for him. Good for you guys. We have Salesman B, a little bit lower. We need to improve him. He only sold $2 million at 28% margin. You know, we got we to gotta help him out a little bit. We got to improve his performance. Okay, what we're doing there, and I'm not saying that is wrong. I'm just saying that's at a very surface level, and we're looking at the results. 
We are looking at the revenue, we're looking at the gross margin, and we're looking at the gross profit dollars. Yeah, that's a good thing. However, we need to go much deeper because how these individual sales reps arrived at those results, I would argue, in the long run for the growth of an individual company is more important than the results themselves. What do I mean by that? Well, if the guy who had $3 million is deliberately not prospecting any new business, not intentionally growing wallet share for individual customers, and largely just picking up the phone and occasionally buying a couple of beers for their customers, is that important? Sure it is. That is not selling. And if the other person who sold only $2 million at 28% margin, but busted his tail and landed three new accounts that are poised for growth in the next five years, well, those are two very different stories. And depending on your goals and depending on where you sit in your market and your market share, I'm not even going to go into market share. There's way too many people who are really thrilled with year over year growth of 8% who are not asking the question, is it possible that my competitors have all grown somewhere between 9 and 10%? I'm going to leave that alone for now. Let's just let that simmer in the background. So again, lead measures. What are we measuring? How are we counting them? And what's important? These are not insignificant questions to ask. So this goes back to our sales performance box score. Now in baseball, the box score was created in 1845 and it was upgraded to its current level. It has many flaws that I'll mention here briefly. In 1859, by a fellow Briton named Henry Chadwick. Anyway, uh, what we know about Henry Chadwick is that he really liked baseball and he was good at popularizing baseball. But when he made the baseball box score, his point of reference was not baseball itself. It was cricket. That's right. Another sport that I barely know anything about, but I do know they use a bat sort of thing. It's a flattened bat. And uh, a guy can be essentially in the batter's box for like six weeks. I don't really know why. And quite frankly, I'm not all that curious. I don't really care. Anyway, Henry Chadwick was responsible for really upgrading and elevating the box score. He came up with the idea of a batting average. Not bad. He came up with the idea of earned run average for a pitcher or ERA. And he came up with the letter K for strikeout. Why is a K in the box score a strikeout? Because S was for sacrifice and it was already used. And Henry Chadwick was elected to the Hall of Fame for the Major League Baseball in 1938. Now, any baseball nerds or sabermetricians, if you will, or followers of Bill James will immediately point out that Henry Chadwick was a jackass. He had a couple giant errors and omissions that drive people crazy. Number one was walks. Originally, he had a walk as an error of the pitcher. Think about that for a minute. Lots of errors for pitchers then. The second part was he said walks have nothing to do with the hitter. The hitter is basically just standing up there like a tourist and watching balls go by. And if he gets a walk, he has nothing to do with it. Which is why, while a walk is no longer an error, a walk to this day does not count as an at-bat. So if you're in professional baseball and you go up there staring down 90 mile an hour fastballs coming really close to your face and you don't make an out and you get to first base... Congratulations, that technically never happened. If you're sensing a bit of outrage, for me, as both a pitcher and a former hitter in high school, I am outraged. I hate that idea. He also ignored what has now become the most important batting statistic, which is ops, which is on base plus slugging. Question, what is slugging? That is the total number of bases divided by your number of at-bats. Anyway, I'm not going to descend into baseball nerdery, but you get the idea. So that was the baseball box score. So how are we taking that idea and bringing that into a sales performance box score? Well, because I like symmetry and because this is just the way the world works, there are 10 metrics that we are including in our sales performance box score. And if you've been listening to this show for a while, you have heard me talk about essentially all of these. So hopefully there'll be a bit of nostalgia. And you can say, you know what? When he talked about the sales fundamentals workshop and what he talked about there, I was kind of nodding my head. Those seem like true fundamentals. Well, great. We're bringing those in here. And hopefully there's an element of common sense here. And if we measure them, and I'll leave it up to you as to to what degree we have some clients that are using this and they're going, they're going deep. 
They are overthinking this in a nerdy sort of way. I love it. I love getting the minutia and how we can think of this in different factors and derivatives. Other people are just thinking, do we have it? Yes or no. It's a binary yes or no situation. You can figure that out later. And again, we have a downloadable tool on our website, behindyourbacksales.com slash tools. You can download this to check out. So what are the 10 elements of our sales performance box score? As I mentioned, the first four are our sales fundamentals. And I consider these internal elements that we can control. If we think about the idea of control, what you can control, these are things that we can control 100% and we should do a better job of it as an industry. And these are, number one, goal setting. Number two, time management. Number three, pipeline management. And again, we can go down a rabbit hole here. I won't. Because right now, if we are not organizing and valuing the individual sales pipelines of our team members, when we know we are going into a recession, to a degree, we are flying blind, all right? So we need to know this. Now, I know what you'll say. I know you're going to say, hey, I talked to my builders. They're giving us ideas. And I talked to my sales reps, some cases, sales managers. We've got an idea. I know. I'm going to challenge you to say is you need to move beyond anecdotal conversations. And by the way, as a builder, builders lie. If they just scrapped 25 acres and are not going to build another 150 homes, they might not be thrilled to tell you that. So heads up, builders lie. Sorry, it's the truth. All right. So pipeline management is number three. So goals, time management, pipeline management, and prospecting. Those are the four fundamentals. That's what we talk about and teach and really get engaged and interactive in our two-day sales fundamentals that will happen next April. It happens every April in Fort Worth. We will be selling that out this Halloween. So here in a couple months, if you're interested, feel free to email me. We'll get on our waiting list. We will sell out. We have our new OSR Academy members. So 20 of the about 85 slots will be taken up by our OSR Academy, which is launching here in September. So anyway, those are our sales fundamentals. Goals, time management, pipeline management, and prospecting. Our belief is, and we have proof of this, if you do these four things reasonably well, while you cannot guarantee success, you will be in a really strong position to succeed no matter what the economy throws at us. So after our sales fundamentals, we're going to flip over to our sales stack. Now, if you listen to episode 259, you heard me go into some detail about our sales stack. Most often we hear about this tech stack. What's the software and hardware that we use in our organization from an IT perspective to scale our business and to make it predictable and repeatable? Well, in sales, I believe we need the same thing. So the sales stack, while internal, right? These are things that we can control. There's also an element of it being external as well because we are engaging ideally face-to-face with our customers and prospects as we go through these things. So our sales stack is your sales process. Do we have a specified sales process that is laid out on paper that's predictable and repeatable? Sales activities. Are we clearly identifying the sales activities, how much time we're spending in these activities, and the output expected? And do those circle back directly to help us achieve our goals? This should be a list. It should not be 100. It should be like five. How do we make it really clear the activities that we want our salespeople engaging in and to make sure it's clear that these are sales activities, not account management activities, and not customer service activities. So you've got your sales process, you have your sales activities, now we have sales skills. What are the skills that we need to obtain, these capabilities that we need to improve upon? Again, this should be a checklist and we are thinking about how we are intentionally developing our salespeople to learn these sales skills. And finally, our sales tools. What are we using from video testimonials to Instagram, our website, product samples, uh, marketing brochures, et cetera? What are our sales tools and are they intentionally designed to be used at specific steps in our sales process? So again, our sales stack is sales process, sales activities, the time we spend in them and the output expected our sales skills, and our sales tools. So those are kind of your four by four matrix. Again, your sales fundamentals, goal setting, time management, pipeline management, and prospecting, and your sales stack, sales process, sales activities, sales skills, and sales tools. Now I realize 
This is eight things and eight things might be hard to keep in mind as you're driving down the road. You can download this in a PDF and see if it makes sense and see if it's worth implementing in your business. But that's eight. I promised 10, correct? Damn right I did. Why 10? Because the real simple math is we could take these 10, we can multiply them by 10, and we can get a 100-point score to evaluate each individual salesperson. So what are the final two? Well, the final two are attitude and effort. That's right. You can do all these things right. And if you have a crappy attitude and your effort is piss poor, well, guess what? You are probably not going to be a highly valued member of your team. So there it is. That is the sales performance box score, the sales fundamentals, goal setting, time management, pipeline management, and prospecting, and our sales stack, sales process, sales activities, sales skills, and sales tools, right? That's eight. And then we have attitude and effort. You will see in the download, you can sit down with one of your sales reps and you can run through and say, all right, on a scale of zero to 10, how well do we do with goal setting? Well, we have an annual goal and we check it monthly. Perfect. I'm going to give you a 10. Time management. What are you using? Oh, you're writing notes on your hand and bar napkins. And then you're saying your time management system is Outlook. All right. I'm going to give you a three. Why? Because I'm nice. By the way, just because you use Outlook doesn't mean you have a time management system. Discussion for another time. But Outlook is not a time management system. It's an element, an obvious element in anyone's day-to-day -day life for using a calendar. It's not a system. <clears throat> I apologize. I get very riled up when we talk about time management. Such an opportunity. And then you can descend down completing the fundamentals. How much time are you spending prospecting right now? Probably zero. In the future, more, right? And then we can run down the sales stack, right? Can you name our sales process? What are the sales skills that you're working on over the next six months, right? We should have answers for these. And then for each one of these, we can give them a score on zero to 10. And then obviously hit attitude and effort, be direct, be candid, be blunt, but be nice, be kind, add those up. And you have a 100 point score. This gives you a really clear way to talk about the performance of your sales reps and for sales managers. This is something that we recommend you do as part of your, what we call your RPA meeting, results, pipeline, and activities. We got this from our friend, Mike Weinberg, who was the star of episode 212 that I would strongly recommend to a friend. We talk about some of the challenges of these meetings where Mike will just say, talk about results, talk about pipeline, talk about activities, keep it to 20 minutes or less. I just cram these together so it's easy to remember for me, call it the RPA meeting. And we took that idea and you will see that that is factored in into this template. So it's designed to gain clarity and monthly updates between sales manager and sales rep. We call it the sales performance box score. I hope you, my friend, find it valuable. Download it, check it out. If you agree with it and you like it, I wanna know why. If you think it's stupid and you think it makes no sense, that's cool too. Your mileage may vary. I'm also curious how you see it. Feel free to email me directly at bradley at behindyourbacksales.com. All right, friends, that's all I've got for today. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, Capital One Trade Credit. If you want to increase sales, increase cash flow while decreasing risk by leveraging a state-of-the-art digital platform to make it easier for people to buy from you, check out Capital One Trade Credit. Again, feel free to go to behindyourbacksales.com slash tools to download your sales performance box score and let me know your thoughts. And of course, this episode or any other one, if you've gotten value from it, I'm gonna ask you to do two things. And hopefully these are small favors. Number one, share with a friend. We've been flattered and thrilled with the growth of this podcast. And it has been done through people like you sharing with other people who hopefully will gain from what we talk about and improve their leadership and sales capabilities. The second thing is, if you do get a few seconds, leave us a quick review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you are using. Those mean more to us than you know. So that's all we've got. We're to close out like we always do with our leadership mantra. You, my friend, are owed nothing. Deliver value first. Make it a great week. Mm -hmm.